Hi everyone, in this video we're going to go through section 4.2 called Null Spaces, Column Spaces, and Linear Transformations. Uh, we'll get a bunch of definitions here, uh, but what we start out with is looking back at something that we saw previously, and that is this system of equations at the top, uh, x1 minus 3x2 minus 2x3 equals 0, negative 5x1 plus 9x2 plus x3 equals 0. Um, that is a homogeneous system, again, that we saw previously. We could write um, our, we could write the coefficient matrix A as uh, 1 minus 3 minus 2, uh, negative 5, 9, and 1, right? Uh, we, we previously solved this homogeneous system, wrote down what the solution looks like, what that vector looks like. Uh, this one, because I have two equations and three variables, we definitely have at least one free variable, if not possibly two. Um, uh, in this section, we take another look at uh, that solution, um, but just again with like kind of a different twist here. Um, and and we'll start out with the the definition for uh, the null space of a matrix, the null space of an M by N matrix A, written with just capital N U L A. That's the null space of A. Is the set of solutions to that homogeneous equation A X equals zero. Um, and then the, the formal notation, the null space of A is the set of all X such that X is in Rn, so X is a, a vector, and A times X equals zero. Um, visually, what we're looking at for the null space of A matrix, okay, if this is Rm over here, um, and this is Rn over there, the null space of A, null a is the set of vectors, okay, so I'm trying to draw this picture nice here, the set of vectors, so there would be the zero vector is in the null space of A, um, that would be the trivial solution, but the set of vectors that all map onto the zero vector, so that guy maps to the zero vector, that guy maps to the zero vector, the zero vector maps to the zero vector, and that vector maps all of them to the zero vector in Rm. That's a great picture. <laughs> uh, but that is the, the visual representation of what the null space of a matrix looks like. All right, so now moving on to our first example here. A is the matrix from the previous example, so let me write that down. A is equal to uh, 1 minus 3 minus 2, and then negative 5, 9, 1. So A is that matrix, and U is the vector given right there. Determine if U belongs to the null space of A. Does U map to the zero vector? What we do is we take A times U. So that is we're going to go 1 minus 3 minus 2, negative 5, 9, 1. And when I multiply that by 5, 3, negative 2, does that map to the zero vector? And uh, if you go through the multiplication, row by column, so first row, first column, does that map to zero, right? So one times five is five, minus nine, uh, and then plus four, five minus nine plus four is zero, and then row to the, that column again, row two to that column, uh, we'll stay with green, uh, does that map to, the z to zero, negative five times five is negative 25, plus 27 minus two, um, that also gives you zero. So, hey, there we go. A times U is equal to zero. Okay, so what we uh, what we say, so U, that vector U, is in the null space of A. All right, so that's the first thing that we can do there is just test if a vector is in the null space. Does it map onto the zero vector? So then we encounter our first theorem here in this section. The null space of an M by N matrix A is a subspace of Rn. So using the term from the previous section, 4.1. Equivalently, the set of all solutions to AX equals 0 uh, is a subspace of Rn. Okay, so the null space is a subspace of Rn is, is basically what the theorem says. Uh, the, the, the second sentence kind of rewords it, but basically says the, the same thing. If we wanted to write a proof of this theorem, it wouldn't be uh, too terrible. Uh, we would just need to show that the three requirements for a subspace are checked off. Uh, so let me write a proof real quick here. So we're going to prove this theorem. Okay, so first we need to show that the zero vector, 
uh, let me just abbreviate it, zero vector, vector is in the null space of A. So if I, if I take A times zero, does that equal zero? Um, yes, it does. So clearly, uh, zero, the zero is in the null space of A. So the zero vector is in null A. A times zero is zero. Uh, closed under addition. Okay, so we define two vectors in the null space. So we'll say let u and v be in the null space of A. That is a times u equals 0 and a times v equals 0. And then we need to show that their sum is also in the null space. So we're going to take, so then um, to show that u plus v is in the null space of a, u, oops, uh, we take a times u plus v, or I'll say then, a times u plus v is equal to a u plus a v, which, hey, that's 0 plus 0, which is 0. So we check that off. Uh, so, so, so u plus v is in the null space of A because we know how to distribute. Nothing monumental there. Uh, then our third requirement is that we are closed under scalar multiplication. Scalar multiplication. Uh, given scalar c, given a scalar c, we're going to take a times cu, which uh, we can rearrange the order here. We can multiply, we can pull that scalar out. c times au, which is c times 0, which is 0. Okay, so cu is in the null space of a. So that's another uh, uh, proof or example of how we show something is a subspace. We've got to check off those three boxes using first the zero vector, then a sum of vectors, then a scalar times a vector, and show that that product or that sum is in uh, the, the vector space. Okay, So that's how that proof works. Moving on to example two, uh, we're given h is a set of vectors in all four whose coordinates a, b, c, d satisfy those two equations. And we have to show that h is a subspace of R4. Well, what we can do here is we can take those two equations, a minus 2b plus 5, oops, plus 5c equals d. And I can rearrange that equation into a minus 2b plus 5c minus d equals 0. And the second one, C minus A equals B. We'll rearrange that one into, what would that one be? A minus B plus C also is equal to zero. Well, now I have a homogeneous system, okay? So what we can say is by theorem two, the theorem from the previous uh, slide, uh, yeah, from the previous slide, by theorem two, H is a subspace, subspace, of R4, okay, because we can, we got, it was a homogeneous system, we can apply theorem two, the null space of A is a subspace of, in this case, R4, okay, so that is just a direct application of the theorem. We could also go through the three steps again, but now I don't have to because I have the theorem. All right, now uh, we get to the more uh, procedural process of an explicit description of the null space of A. So if I need to find what is called a spanning set for the null space of A, what I do is I take my matrix here. My A is uh, three rows by one, two, three, four, five columns. So I have a three by five matrix here. All right. And what I want to do is I want to put it in reduced row echelon form. That's what we need to do. So I'm going to augment A uh, with a column of zeros, a zero is equal to, let's see, so three, negative six, or negative three, six, there we go, minus one, one, minus seven, one, minus two, two, three, minus one, and then two, negative four, five, eight, uh, negative four. So there's my A matrix, augment it with a column of zeros, 
and in my TI-89, TI-89, I'm going to put that in reduced echelon form. When you do that, you get 100, zero, zero. you get negative 200, zero, zero. Zero, 010, zero. negative, whoops, negative, whoops, yeah, negative 1, uh, 2, 0, 3, negative 2, 0, and 0, 0, 0. So we get a row of zeros and two pivots, all right? Make sure you can still type that in your calculators correctly. Hopefully you haven't forgotten how to use them. You should be using uh, those as, to, as you go through the, the lecture notes. You should be using your calculators as you go through the homework to put these uh, matrices in echelon form and all that. All right, so uh, back to this question. Now I, I still need to have my spanning set, find my spanning set for the null space of this matrix. So once we have it in echelon form like that, or reduced echelon form, let me rewrite what, I, what my system looks like now. So we have x1 minus 2x2 minus x4 uh, plus 3x5 equals 0. That's that top equation just written back with the algebra. Uh, x3 plus 2x4, that's a 4, there we go, uh, minus 2x5 equals 0. And then the third equation is a bunch of zeros. That one just says 0 equals 0. All right, now we're going to represent our solution for each x, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. So what can I represent for each of them? Uh, first of all, you would need to check and identify where the missing pivots are. So we're missing a pivot here, missing a pivot there, missing a pivot there. So those are my free variables. So x5, uh, that one stays x5, x4, that one stays x4 x3 I write in terms of those free variables so that would be negative uh, 2x4 plus 2x5 x2 is my other free variable and then x1 in terms of the free variables positive 2x2 two two, um, plus x4 and minus 3x5 and then just something before I move on to the next step to make a note of or a visual note of is as I'm writing down what each of those x is equals, notice that you know I'm, I'm solving for x1, so all of those signs uh, are, are, are becoming the opposite when I write down that next step. All right, now keep going here. I'm going to split that vector up into, since I have three free variables, I'm going to split it up into three vectors. I have an x2 vector that has entries 2, 1, 0, 0, 0. I have an x3, no, not an x3. I have an x4 vector that has entries 1, 0, negative 2, 1, 0. And I have an x5 vector that has entries negative 3, 0, 2, 0, 1. Okay, so those are my, uh, that's my split apart uh, into three vectors with each of the three variables. Uh, if I call this guy u, this guy v, and that one w, we can write our solution as x2 times u plus x3, x5, I keep writing 3, x4 times v plus x5 times w. So that's what my solution looks like. All right, and what does it mean? How do we now we go, this is stuff that we've kind of done before, but to go back to the null space topic concept, all right, what that means is that every linear combination okay, of those three vectors u, v, and w is in the null space of A u maps to the zero vector, v maps to the zero vector, w maps to the zero vector, and every single linear combination of those three vectors, given any scalars x2, x4, and x5, all map to zero. Okay, another way to write that, whew, another way to write that, there we go, is the set u, v, w is a spanning set or the null space of my matrix A. 
All right, so now we get to the next uh, definition in the section. We define what is a col the column space of a matrix. So we've already gone through null space. Now we move to column space. Uh, and the column space of a matrix A is the set of all linear combinations of the columns of A. Okay, so it's if I have A being a set of columns, a, or if I look at A as just the columns A1 through AN, then the column space is defined as the span of A1 through an okay so it's this the span of the set of linear combinations of the columns of my matrix all right and then theorem three uh, which we're not going to prove this because we did we did the last theorem but the column space of a matrix is a subspace of rn and then another way to look at column space is or another way to kind of conceptualize it to write it down is the set of all b's such that b is equal to ax for some x in rn okay so it's the set of all vectors that have that have a solution, essentially. In this next example, example four, we have to find a matrix A such that W, the set W, is the column space of A. All right, and the way that this starts out, W is this, this vector here where that contains A's and B's. And what we can do is we can write W a little bit differently. We can split it up into an A vector, six, one, negative 7 plus a b vector uh, and my b vector is minus 1 1 0 so I've split w up into those two vectors for a and b in R all right and now I can say all right uh, well if I let a be those two columns those two vectors 6 1 negative 7 minus 1 1 0 then w uh, oops then is the column space that should be a capital c not a huge deal though w is the column space of that matrix that i just wrote down that's it that's all there is to doing that example right this the set of linear combinations of the columns of a is the column space of a and that's how w was given Okay, so there's a short little example there. In this next example, uh, what we're looking at is just really the size of the column in the null space. Okay, so uh, given A, which by the way is three rows by four columns. Okay, and part A says if the column space of A is a subspace of RK, what is the value of K? All right. Well, the way that we look at that is um, the column space of A is a subspace of R, oops, R3. Okay, so why did I say that it's a subspace of R3? The reason for that is because the columns in A have three entries. The column space of A is a subspace of R3 because the columns have three entries. It's three rows, but the columns have one, two, three entries in them. Okay, contrast that with part B, my RK in part B. The null space of A is a subspace of, well, maybe you guessed it, I don't know, R4. The null space of A is a subspace of R4, and this because is also really important because b slash c abbreviation for because if you haven't seen it but because the vector x in a x equals zero it needs four entries for a times x to be defined okay now you could simply just memorize this that the column space is the number of rows the null space is the number of columns but i think it's more important in my opinion to know the why yes it's the number of rows yes it's the number of columns but the reason for that is what your goal should be to understand columns have three entries x needs four entries for ax to be defined that's the why all right, in this next example, um, we're given a matrix A, it's three by four, and we have to find a non-zero vector in the column space of A and a non-zero vector in the null space of A, since uh, the, the word non-zero is in there because 
they're both uh, the zero vector is in both of them. So it would be really easy to write down the zero vector as both answers, but that's why they specify that. All right. So for the first part, find a non-zero vector in the column space of A. Um, we can take take any uh, column for the column space of A. Well, that sounds pretty anticlimactic. Uh, but I could literally just take column 1, 2, minus 2, 3. Or I could take the second column, or the third or the fourth. Or I could add the first and the second, or add the first and the fourth. It really doesn't matter. But it's easiest just to take the first column, because column space is defined as the set of linear combinations of the columns of A. So take 1 times the first column plus 0 times all the rest. And that's it. Okay, uh, for the null space of A, that's the one that we have to do some work for. We're gonna get we need reduced row echelon form, oops, for the null space for null A. So if I take A with a column of zeros and augment it, what we end up with is one zero nine zero zero, and then zero one negative five zero one minus five uh, zero zero. And then zero 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 one zero. Okay, there's our uh, reduced echelon form, and what we get is that x one is negative nine x three, and x two is positive five x three, and x four happens to be zero. Oh, I didn't write down x three. Um, let me do that. X three is free. That I should have squeezed in there. Okay, um, so to to answer this question, I need an actual vector. Uh, if I just let x3 equal 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 or 57, who cares, uh, then my x answer is, and I'm just going to write this one horizontally, negative 9 and uh, what's x2? Positive 5. x3 is free. That's the one that I'm choosing. x4 is always 0. So there's my solution vector. All right, that's all. So we have our, that x is in the null space, and then the column here is in the column space. All right, the next example, example seven, uh, given two, those two vectors, u and v, um, first is u in the null space of matrix A, which is the same one from the previous example. Uh, could it be in the column space? And then the opposite, the same question about v. Um, we'll do A first, is u in the null space? So what we do is we take A, times u and if you go through that product um, what you should get is zero I think negative three three but go through the actual you know uh, multiplication to make sure uh, and hey is that the zero vector did a times u map to zero nope so is u in the null space u is not in the null space of a could it be in the column space the answer to that is definitely no it doesn't have the right number of entries you would need to only have three entries to be in the column space. How can I take columns and get uh, with three entries and get something with five? So, so no, it can't. Uh, part B is V in the column space. To answer that question, what we need to do is take and augment A with the vector V and put that into, uh, well, actually, technically, we only need echelon form. We just need, and let me write it this way, we need AV to be consistent all right that's what we need for av to be consistent we could we could put it into reduced echelon form if we wanted to but really what we need is is echelon form and what you find out if you do augment and again use your calculator if you want to for this or you could go through the row operations av is row equivalent to two zero zero four one zero minus two minus five zero 1, negative 4, 17, and 3, negative 2, 1. And because that is consistent, then V is in the column space of A. I can form V using linear combinations of the columns of A. All right? Um, and then the, the answer to the second part of B, could, you, could V be in the null space of A? No, it couldn't because A times V is not defined if v doesn't have the right number of entries so that'd be that's a no okay this next slide give it a read uh it's just contrasting talking about the differences between uh null and column space 
uh, pause the video if you want, or, or it'll be in the PDF upload of the notes as well. All right, in this next slide, um, when we talk about linear transformations, as we often do throughout this course, um, we just use a slightly tweaked notation, or not notation, a, a slightly different uh, set of terms. So we have a, a linear transformation. We define a linear transformation t from a vector space v into a sp vector space w. Uh, and it's a rule that assigns each, each vector x a unique vector t of x, right? So that's the notation that we've used previously for linear transformation. Uh, and then the 1 and the 2 there are just, you know, those both have to be true for something to be considered a, quote, linear transformation. Um, so the terms that we've been introduced to in this section, kernel, or excuse me, null space, column space, when we talk about transformations, we sometimes use slightly different terms. Um, the kernel is the transformation word for null space. The kernel of the transformation, the null space of the transformation, is the set of vectors that map to the zero vector, such that t of u is equal to zero. That's the kernel. Then the range of t is the set of all vectors in W of the form t of x. That's the, the range are the vectors that came from, that were produced by the transformation t. If t happens to arise as a matrix tra transformation, say t of x equals ax for some matrix a, the range and kernel are the null and column space as they were defined earlier. Okay, so that's what that, the, second, the, the last part of this definition, big giant definition, set of definitions says range, is better known as the uh, column space. Kernel is better known as the null space. They're just words that we use when we're talking about transformations. They're not going to come up super often, um, but you should be familiar with them. And then this picture here at the bottom, um, I just, rather than try to draw this again, because that always goes so well, uh, it's just visually, uh, I, I just took a picture out of the book, it's just visually where, what the kernel looks like and, and the range looks like. But again, they are the, the, the null space and column space, just as different terms. Example 8 is the last example that we'll just look at in this section. There's not much to do in the example, um, so you can give it a read, see if it makes sense. But basically it says that if I have a vector space that is real-valued functions f, so a vector space that is a set of functions that are defined on some interval with the property that they're differentiable, that their derivative exists, and their derivatives are continuous on that interval, w is the vector space c uh, of a, b of all continuous functions on a b so notations getting a little bit weird in here but we're letting d from v oops d from v into w be the transformation that changes f in v to its derivative f prime that was a lot of setup to say that that we're defining a transformation that takes a function and maps it to its derivative okay uh, in calculus we encounter differentiation rules that basically say that this this as a transformation is linear if i have the derivative of a sum that is a sum of derivatives back in calculus if you have f of x equals x squared cubed plus 3x that's the derivative of a sum right you take the derivative of each term f prime of x is equal to you take the derivative of each term individually x 3x squared plus 3 that's our linear transformation on the left, that, that property of linear transformations on the left, the, the d of f plus g is d of f plus d of g, okay? And then the one on the right, the derivative of a constant times a function is c times the derivative, right? That's where if I have f um, of x is equal to, I don't know, uh, three times e to the five x. Oh God, bringing back flashbacks at calc one. Then f prime of x is, well, the 3 tags along, and we take the derivative of e to the 5x is 5e to the 5x, right? That hopefully looks familiar from some math course of the past. Well, that's the second property of linear transformations. Um, so the, that, that means that the derivative is itself a linear transformation. The derivative as a function, as an operator, is a linear transformation. Okay, um, and then the rest of the example goes on to just kind of state the kernel of D is the set of constant functions and the range of D is the set W of all continuous functions on AB. Okay, and um, 
Oh, yeah, that's right. That's what I wanted to say. That Just to go back to this point here about the kernel of D is the set of constant functions. I've got tons of underlining going on here. But why is the kernel of D the set of constant functions? Well, think back to what's the derivative of a constant? Zero. So the set of constant functions, constants, are all the, 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 the things that map to the zero vector. That's the kernel. That's the null space. Okay, so it's kind of a cool thing to a cool callback to calculus and all these these words that we're using here in linear algebra. We can apply to to some things that we've seen previously. All right, that is the end of this section. Um, work on the homework. Let me know if you have questions. Thanks for listening.